In this episode, I am speaking with two technology leaders about Amazon's new humanoid robots, Elon Musk predicting that AI will put an end to work, SBF finally being found guilty of fraud, Spotify announcing their plans for AI-generated music, and the Game of Thrones author suing OpenAI over copyright claims. Welcome back to the podcast. The Alfie Wattam Podcast. Awesome. So let's kick off with a new innovation in the world of robotics. Um, this is a robot which is being developed and sold to Amazon, amongst others. I'll show you a quick timeline of this. So back in 2012, it was very, very basic. They were just trying to get the legs working. Uh, 2015, it started to do a little bit of movement and walking. 2017, you can see the innovation. You can see the advancement. It's basically a walking pair of legs at this point. 2019, it's got arms and can lift a box very badly. Uh, and then it gets better and better. It's going upstairs. It's carrying boxes with QR codes so it can read them using AR. And then in 2022, the partnership with Amazon happened and it's now carrying boxes. It's now packaging. It's now distributing boxes all across the world and replacing warehouse workers. The way that it bends, the way that it works with its legs, some people are even saying is like a, a better version of human legs, just, just the way that they, they operate. Can't get sick, doesn't call in late, it doesn't take annual leave, 24-7 robots for, for, for the future. Um, cool. What, what, what are your thoughts when you see, when you see that robot? Why don't, why don't we start with yourself, Harry? Yeah, I, I mean, it definitely, it's, they've gone down the humanoid route, haven't they, rather yeah. than something like Ocado, which uh, has a you know, totally automated sort of um, facility, what do they call it, facilitation or provisioning um, uh, sort of distribution centers, whatever, yeah. whatever, yeah. whatever the right word is, but they, you know, they're, they're taking a very different approach where it's much more kind of like these dynamic kind of trolleys that move around the, the, the network. And so, yeah, it's an interesting approach. Maybe, maybe it's going to facilitate Amazon's transition to fully automated warehouses. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's an, un, yeah, it feels like an unusual move yeah. to me. I'm, yeah, I, of course it's, um, yeah, there's obviously going to be loads of concerns by, Lots of Amazon employees, right? Is this, are, these, yeah. are these humanoid robots going to start stealing my jobs? Uh, which is, I think, totally fair enough. But I, I don't know. My my overall opinion is, I feel a bit skeptical. Like this is actually a, that is a, a good solution to to the problem. Yeah, really. And we, we've talked many times on this show about different types of robots which are not humanoid, which are what you described. How it's there's many, many, many different options, such as like those like self-driving robot um, vacuum cleaner sort of things, and they mm. can go under shelves and pick things exactly. up. And, yeah. and we've seen Amazon using those, but this is obviously a little bit more um, almost scary to um, a lay person that just sees like a humanoid robot and they're like, oh my God, it's, it's, it had legs walking and now it's got arms, now it's lifting boxes, mm. what, what next? What, what's your take, Sam, when you see this? There's something in the uncanny valley, isn't there? As soon as you move towards a humanoid, kind of shape yeah. people go oh no it's actually coming for my job rather than just supporting but it's not fundamentally doing anything different than the little puck robots that were moving entire yeah. uh, units around it's not doing it any more efficiently than those um, but I think it's a transition problem so Amazon's got a warehouse full of boxes that are designed to be picked up by hands mm. and moved from one place to another and that's a lot of infrastructure that already exists yeah so if you can just add a couple of robots into there and slowly move through that transition, that feels feels like that's where they're going for, is, is yeah. this kind of slow replacement of humans. Exactly. I think right now it's probably used more as like a like a co-pilot, I guess would be the word. You know, humans are there, but the, the, the robots are, are making life easier. But I think very, very quickly, like it's going to start just replacing a lot of those jobs, which um, are quite automated uh, for, for the most part. Um, you raise that, that, that question and we have a great topic in the, in the next segment about AI putting an end to work. Um, but I guess from this perspective with the robots, what, what, what do you think, Harry? Do you, do you see this replacing Amazon workers globally over the next couple of years? I think a couple of years is probably a bit of a stretch. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I, it is it's definitely sort of must be nerve wracking if you are in those sort of low skilled sort of more manual jobs and and increasingly actually the higher skilled less manual jobs are, are looking looking more and more automatable every day yeah. but um yeah i i'm i'm not sure i i think this is a trend we've seen 
for the last sort of 60, 70 years since the Industrial Revolution, right? That there's just always been a move to more automation. And it's, it's interesting, actually, I know I'm deviating from your question about Amazon specific ones, but uh, it seems to be much more of an agenda item now. It mm. sort of seems to be affecting the higher skilled jobs much, much more. So, yeah, I, 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 th- I think, yes, it, there's definitely, there's probably not much stopping the technology from, from working at that sort of pace. I think probably it's going to be much more of a kind of political hot button topic now. Um, and, and it's much more likely to be regulated against and jobs to be protected by, yeah. by more automation. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I've been talking about this exact topic on the podcast since 2020 now mm. and when, when we started. And every single year I've seen it become more and more the public narrative and people talking about it more and more and more. So um, I agree jobs will be replaced, jobs will be created as well for developers, for the designers, for data people and so on. But you raise an interesting point there, Harry, because a lot of the jobs that are being replaced we thought it would be self-driving cars replacing Uber drivers. We thought it would be robots replacing warehouse workers. And we're seeing that. But a lot of what we're seeing is AI replacing developers and, mm. and accountants and, and lawyers and, and all those different high skill professions. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens, um, not just in, in like the blue collar work, but in the white collar work as well. Um, what, what's your take on the, on the job side, Sam? I think we're a long way away from it being replaced. Um, yeah, we, we hear... GPT can write code, but the code that it writes is um, kind of snippets of Stack Overflow. It's not, let's build something new. Yeah. And I think it'll work similar with the Amazon robots. We'll see AI working alongside those high-skilled workers. You'll see uh, legal professionals drafting contracts yeah. using AI tools to generate chunks for them. We'll see um, accountants using it to do automation, which means you can give a lot more focus to different areas. So you can do your job better rather than being entirely replaced. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I do think that last kind of 20%, and it's the same with what's, yeah, exactly as you say, with some of the large language model work that's been going on recently. It's that last 20% of, you know, getting to human level is, is really hard yeah. to, uh, to, to get to. And so whilst there's been a lot of big leaps, I mean, look at self-driving cars. It's like the promise has been there. It's always been a couple of years away from everyone's going to be giving up, giving up driving for the, like the last decade or so. And it still hasn't really happened. And to be honest, probably isn't going to happen anytime soon because just sure. because of that last, yeah. last 20% is so difficult to get right. Yeah. I, I agree that AI can be a, a, and robotics can be a phenomenal tool to, automate a lot of the work, but I, I agree that the human quality control check at the end, whether that's a lawyer reviewing the AI, whether that's a developer reviewing the code before it goes into production, it's still so important. Like you can't just trust it implicitly. We, I've seen this many times with my recruiting business because we see so many CVs where it says on the CV, like um, under bullet points for, for jobs as a large language model, I cannot. And it's, it's literally <laughs> just copy and pasting from GPT. And, and like if you're doing that, then that's probably more of a red flag on you than, than, than the AI. But um, yeah, it's interesting to see people um, trusting it implicitly, whereas I personally would not. I, I feel a lot more skeptical. What, what about you two? Would you, are you all in on trusting it or are you, are you quality control checking it? No, I mean, I, I love the machine learning. AI has been like a, a passion for a while, back from uni days where we were building single uh, neural nets on chips. And we were yeah. kind of going, oh, this machine learning stuff's going to be amazing one day. Um, and one day is always you know, yeah. two years away. Yeah. Um, we were five years ago. Um, I sat through some some work in the government that was talking about, hey, this this machine learning stuff is going to replace jobs soon. What are we going to do about it? Um, uh, and they were talking about self driving cars and and trucks, and there was a lot more focus on which jobs are going to be replaced. And still, it's it's always tomorrow. Yeah, it's always it's always just across the horizon. And one day that will come. Today's not. I have used it like it's cool yeah you can use it to do some of the grunt work yeah you know sketch me out a an email that does this thing yeah there you go turn it out but you still read it yeah um you know you treat it a little bit more like a an intern that you might pass a task to yes. and say yes yeah. go in do this thing it's, come an, back it's to an intern me. it's not a coo yes. exactly yeah exactly yeah i agree i i actually don't really use um, any of the large language model services really to like to, to, to do my day-to-day communicating or sure, like improving sure. it. I don't, yeah. I don't use it for that actually. I think um, 
so much of my job as CEO of um, of of the business, I've realized is it, like, there's such little nuances mm -hmm. in a relationship with someone um, that just a generalized language model yeah. at the moment just isn't going to have the context to understand. Yeah. And maybe that will change. Maybe one day I will sort of pre-train my uh, uh, sort of self-hosted large language model on my entire email history and it will actually pick up those nuances. But um, I, I don't know. I, I'm not convinced that it's that'll save me time. So I can yeah. I can knock out um, you know a quick response just much more quickly and, and capture everything. And that's, that's part. That's quite a, that's quite a strong skill of mine. Almost mm -hmm. I'd, I'd sort of say, and it's, it seems like a strange skill to sort of talk about. But it's it's really really important. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and certainly I, I certainly haven't found that like that part of the automation process has been particularly helpful. Yeah. We, we tend to overestimate what we can do in a year, but underestimate what we can do in like a decade. Mm -hmm. And I think that's. Um, that, that, that kind of ties us into the next story, really, because Elon Musk, he's probably got a longer term thinking about this, but he, he said that AI will put an end to work. So the world's richest man made the stunning prediction at the AI safety summit during a conversation with the UK Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. I'm not sure if you've seen the talk at uh, Bletchley Park, but um, the headline uh, across all media was he said AI will replace the need for us to, to work. Um, he didn't give any timelines on that, okay? <laughs> um, like he often has a habit of, of doing, but um, yeah, but what, what, what are your thoughts on us potentially living like a wall -E type situation? We're all sitting around <laughs> and robots are doing everything, AI is automated. What, what do you think, Sam? One day, maybe. I mean, the talk was amazing for generating headlines and sound bites. I don't think humans will ever settle mm with sitting around and being served on. I think there is a, a drive always for the next thing and a, and a future reaching. So people will still work. Yeah. It yeah. might not look like the work model that we have today, where you, you, know, you do your nine to five and then you come back around and you do other things. So I think the life model and the social model will change, yeah. Yeah. but people will still have reasons to do something. I think AI will put an end to work in the current model. Yeah. but will never kill work, drive, passion from, from humans. Yeah. I mean, if you just swap the word AI for the industrial revolution or just technology it, itself, you know, we went from, not, not we, but, but our <laughs> great, great, great grandparents went from working in, you know, coal mines and, and for hundreds of hours a week to, um, you know, working uh, in, in crazy, ridiculous, high pressure environments that were super dangerous. And, just, and now people are complaining about their four day work week sort of thing. So, so we, we've definitely yeah. gone less and less, less hours. And I really feel like this sort of thing will probably be quite exponential where it just kind of in, in a space of like three years, it just kind of all the hours just get lower and lower and lower as tasks get automated. But what, 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 what's your take? Yeah, I think I sort of disagree with that. Actually, I think what a lot of automation seemed to to do, and this is a very, in a very general sense, I'm sure there's counterpoints, but yeah. the, seemingly the more automation has been in our workflows and the way we can do our work, almost the more work we've, we've mm -hmm. ended up doing, the higher expectations there are on your productivity. Um, and, it, you know, in a lot, you know, a lot of people work office jobs, f you know, far longer than they, they used to, just purely because there's the, the technology there to sort of always be on and always uh, be productive. Yeah. And, um, so I, I'm not sure. I'm not convinced that the history tells us that actually more automation is going to mean less less working hours. I I agree though that the we haven't ever seen a sort of level of intelligence that's yeah. kind of seems to be coming with with the latest revolution in AI. But uh, so that may well change. But there's yeah, as you say, it's come to such big social change um, that actually yeah I, I'm you know it's interesting to to see the sort of maybe wealthier portion of our society um, do have the ability to sort of work less and maybe focus on on other passion projects and all that sort of thing. And, and maybe that could be a direction we, we go. And I'd love to see that. That, yeah. would, be, that would be a, a, a kind of utopian vision of the future. Yeah. Um, but as I say, I... I feel a little bit skeptical from what mm -hmm. from what history is. I, I, I get what you're yeah. saying. It's definitely mm -hmm. a first world problem, isn't mm -hmm. it? That, that, that we're talking about right now. So mm -hmm. we're saying it from a position of privilege, right? But what, what about um, the angle of something like like a universal basic income? Because if if in theory people don't need to work, and I agree with what you're saying, people still probably will. I can't sit for five minutes without you know 
yeah. checking X or emails or doing something, right? So um, even if I had robots serving me all the time, I'd still be trying to build a startup or, or something or do, you know, it's just, just in my DNA. But 99% mm. um, of the world probably would, would be happy with working a little bit and then and then using all that free time to, to travel and explore and, and, and live and play and enjoy. And why wouldn't they, right? Um, that's, a, that's a great thing. But how are people going to pay for rent, for food, if they don't have a, a job or if they're, they're working only 10, 20 hours a week? You know, do we need some kind of universal basic income or, you know, it, an easy question for, for 9, 29 a.m. <laughs> on, on the morning, right? But um, if you've given any thought to, to what happens from that perspective with the, with the economy? Universal basic income is a great concept. Uh, as you move to this concept where there is just a limited amount of work and everything else is, is free and fun, um, the Star Trek economy okay. yeah. is probably the best model we currently have as an end state. And that sounds kind of a bit funny, but the idea of, hey, everything can be available and free for all and you can go and do big humanity kind of exploration and, and travel. Sure. That's about the best that we have. That would be like the perfect vision, right? That's the end state, surely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what's your take? Um, I think I think work is one factor of that sort of utopian vision. I think there's speaking in a sort of slightly more abstract sense. So there are, you know, we live in a in a sort of finite world, yeah. uh, um, and there are, I think there are other things that would need to fall into place, like you know free unlimited energy sources <laughs> and uh, the, the, the reason I, I sort of say that is because as soon as there's sort of finite resources it feels like there is some level of competition for sort of ownership of those sources and therefore there feels like there's some some level of, of work to sort of you know someone's going to be competing for it yeah. and yeah. between different interests and in countries or at a national or kind of individual level mm -hmm. um, humans are just hardwired to to sort of you know want want more and want that ownership and so yeah, I, I feel like there's there's a there's not only the societal, um, but the sort of the kind of technical capability as well, but also perhaps these other set of parameters that are <laughs> they're quite that's quite an abstract sort of point, but yeah, uh, yeah. certainly I feel like there's there, yeah, it's, there's it's other not, it's not a simple question, is it? Yeah, and there's no simple answer to it. Yeah, and I think anybody, whether that's me or or you or anyone tries to give an answer to that mm. question, we're just guessing. We're like, like totally, we have yeah. no idea. Yeah. That's what's so exciting and interesting about it. Like the next decades we'll see more innovation and and change than we've seen in the past hundred years. You know, it's mm. um yeah. Great time to be alive. <laughs> it will be in 50 years. Yeah, yeah, well, it'll be, yeah, even, even greater. Hey, this podcast is brought to you by we love alpha.com. If you're looking to grow and hire and scale your software engineering team in the UK, then go to welovealpha.com to hire the best software developers on the market. Everything across Java to C Sharp to PHP to Python to React and Angular and mobile and more. Go to welovealpha.com to hire the best software engineers in the UK now. One thing that isn't a good time, or one person that's not having a great time to be alive rather right now is uh, Sam Bankman-Fried, who we've talked about on the pod many times. So SBF has been found guilty of the FTX crypto fraud. So Sam Bankman-Fried now faces decades in prison. I think it's up to over a hundred years if you got the full sentence for running the billion dollar blockchain scam. We've talked about this many times on the pod. I think everybody listening, watching knows the story of FTX, but just for the people that, uh, that have been living under a rock, um, the easiest way of me explaining it, which is what, is what I did to explain it to my, to, my, to my grandmother a couple of weeks back, she had no idea what was going on, is he had an exchange for crypto, loads of transactions, loads of money happening through it. He had this hedge fund, I think would be the right word, on, on the side, this research company, and he was basically just funneling money to it and then using that to buy expensive homes and, and clothes and a lifestyle and, and whatever. But he's gone from, uh, I believe, the world's youngest billionaire, or certainly um, up there, to now facing the rest of his life behind bars. And probably he's going to get, well, he's going to get jail time. I mean, I'd be very mm -hmm. surprised if he didn't. I know he's paid off a lot of people, but he's probably going to get jail time. I don't know if he'll get 100 years. He might, you know, get 10, 20, 30 years. But I mean, wild story, right? Wild times for blockchain, wild times for, for, for crypto. What are your takes on this? What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I've, 
I feel like I always come across as a skeptic in conversations <laughs> with you, but uh, yeah, I, I think um, crypto has been just a kind of a massive overindulgence of <laughs> of, of kind of technology and, and hype, and yeah. it's I don't know, it's, it feels like certainly it's well, we obviously experienced a, um, the sort of crypto crash fairly recently, and it sort of hasn't really recovered since. But um, yeah, I. I I love the idea of, of crypto and, and the idea that you can have a sort of trustless um, peer-to-peer exchange of, of money and not need this kind of banking infrastructure in the middle. I, I know that comes with plenty of challenges um, that would be difficult to sort of regulate and all that sort of stuff. But the idea of it is brilliant. Um, but it has sort of obviously crypto in general has been totally kind of um, sabotaged by the sort of speculation element. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, to be honest, as, as sorry as I sort of feel for him, he's clearly a, a fraudster, and um, you know you've, you you can imagine being a sort of a young founder in that situation, lots of money pouring in, difficult decisions to make, having absolutely no experience, having to make it quickly. It's I'm sure I'm sure there's sort of two sides to the story here, but certainly on the on the surface of it, it it feels like yeah he's he's been a bit yeah been a bit silly with with what he's what he's tried to do there and taken too much advantage of it and come back to bite him. So I, I think it's going to be a good thing ultimately for the for the crypto sector, actually. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. These bad apples need to be rooted out because mm. see, the, the fundamental technology is is excellent. You know, mm. the, the idea of, of replacing banks and so many other industries that can, you know, that, that could be innovated by, by this type of technology. What, what's your take on, on the story, Sam? I mean, I wasn't surprised. We, we didn't sit through the trial and then go, oh no, what a pity he's been found guilty. I was really rooting for <laughs> It was like a guy. couple of hours the jury debated for and they were like, right, 110 yeah. years. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. His main defence seemed to be the lawyers were in the room while I did it, so it must have been legal. Yeah, he was relying on the accountants, on the lawyers, on yeah. the advisors. It was, it was someone else's fault, not me, but actions were taken. It wasn't an accident. So yeah, it seemed pretty, it seemed pretty clear what was going on. And he might have done the... I didn't think anyone would know, you know, I'll take out of the petty cash and buy something and I'll put it back tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. But he's still done that thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, it's, it's interesting. And I totally, I want to just come back to that point, actually, that you, you can't, uh, being a young, oh, I started my business when I was 26 and, yeah, me too. you know, suddenly yeah. you, you, you know, you end up with X million pounds in a bank account and suddenly, you know, you, you actually have, there's a huge responsibility on your shoulders to manage that money correctly and, yep. um, and it's not, diff- to be honest, it's not difficult to do, but I imagine when the sums sort of increase to billions rather than millions, um, you know, suddenly there's a different level of pressure and, mm-hmm. um, I, so I, I totally agree he should be locked away. I think what he's done is, is wrong. But I, the other perspective is slightly that um, there are also probably a bunch of investors behind him who are kind of being shielded from this whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're obviously probably encouraging the whole act- activity in the background. And, you know, whilst I'm falling short of saying he's been manipulated, um, I definitely, I, I empathise perhaps with his position of responsibility a little bit in that sense. Sure. I mean, I've never been in that situation where I've got billions of, of, of <laughs> dollars, but I mean, people can do crazy things and he clearly made the, the, the wrong decision, mm-hmm. but I, I understand everything that, that, that you're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people are saying that kind of the whole funder of blockchain, of crypto, has kind of been stolen by, by AI, really, and then kind of that's taken over the, the, the news cycle and all the, you've seen that in VC, for example, and basically, um, with my recruiting company, it's like the best indicator in terms of which sectors are doing well because mm-hmm. companies are hiring in that space. Well, they've, they've got money, they're doing well. And when, when we started the business, it was like 70% crypto companies. And now it's like 80% AI companies. Mm-hmm. So but what are your views on AI kind of stealing the, the limelight and the, the show a little bit? Yeah, I think it's definitely having a moment, isn't it? I think... Uh... More so than crypto, though, this is based on reality. I think that's the fundamental yeah. difference, mm-hmm. right? There is real tangible benefit. Yeah. We've been, my business is a, is within the sort of generative AI yeah. space. Yeah. Um, it's a synthetic data company and it has, it's not a large language model, but it's very much sort of fits into that category. And, you know, from, this isn't a new, um, technology, you, you know, you, you've been tinkering with the technology yeah. since, since university and obviously it's gone yeah. on leaps and bounds, but, um, I think there's a the big difference here. There are real companies out there that solve real problems using and leveraging this this technology. So I think the hype is definitely 
you know, we are in a hype cycle, but yeah. it is, mm -hmm. it's founded on much more reality this time around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a big difference between showing an elderly relative GPT-4 and then, then going, wow, that's, that's amazing. You know, mm. is, that, is that somebody typing it really quick and giving me the answer, which is <laughs> genuinely what I've, what I've been told, yeah. um, as opposed to when I spent like 20 grand on a JPEG, you know, of a cat or something, <laughs> or an NFT, and then, and then tried to give it away to parents for a Christmas gift because it was like worth a penny. <laughs> I mean, that, that, I got burned by that, but you know, so far I haven't with AI, so I, I feel a little bit more optimistic about it. But what's your take? Then? I think we'll go through the hype cycle yeah. and come out the other side and the companies that are providing value will yeah. still stick around. Blockchain as a technical concept, not crypto, but blockchain as a technical mm. concept of decentralized ways of storing data has value. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Crypto, NFTs, assorted hype, scams in the case of, sure. uh, of other people, and the pyramid schemes that were built on top of it yeah. will fall aside. And there's so many um, of them. I mean, it, 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 it's hard to determine which ones are worth following versus which ones aren't because of all the scams involved. I mean, I, I like the fundamental principles of something like uh, like Bitcoin, I bought in quite mm. early to that, Ethereum. Again, there's so many use cases with the smart contracts and everything, but it seems like 99% of these coins are just a way to make a, a rug pull, make a lot of money and then quickly, you know, take everything out. Blockchain has the same problem that AI will eventually have, yeah. which is so many use cases for blockchain could be dealt with just by a database mm. and just, just stop faffing with this blockchain thing and just mm. use the traditional technologies. It does the job fine and you don't need all of this. You'll end up with the same thing for AI where someone will just throw AI at a problem that realistically just needs a bit of stats sure. and, and you'll be fine. And then there are use cases which go, this is a tool that is the right tool for the job. Yeah. And so once we move out of that hype cycle where the fact that AI is the, the, the central point for a business, rather than saying this is the value that the business brings and it does it by using AI, yeah. rather than saying this business uses AI to do something, yeah. um, that focus from the businesses I think is where you will be able to identify the value businesses rather than the hype businesses yeah. yeah final thoughts on the on the topic Harry yeah I mean I'm just I'm just personally really excited about the AI space and yeah, yeah having so we founded hazy in 2017 and have yeah. just just seen the kind of you know the the, the, the build of, of generative you know generative models and the kind of complexity increasing and the the, the abilities of them increasing over that time frame is it's really it's, it's been really exciting actually yeah um, and yeah, no, I am. I'm. I'm really interested in what the future. As a self-proclaimed <laughs> skeptic, yes. a lot around a lot of technology. I think this, you know, and um, it's clearly was why I've chosen to work in it. But yeah. uh, it's. I, I'm really excited about terms of AI. Cool. I think. It, I think there's a lot of potential. This is very much an AI themed episode, but, but our, our next, uh, I mean, most of them are nowadays. It's, uh, yeah. That's what the headlines are talking about, right? But uh, Daniel Ek uh, has announced Spotify will not ban AI music. So Spotify's founder made the announcement during an interview with BBC's tech editor, Zoe Kleinman. Uh, Zoe's great. We've talked about her stories many, many times on the pod. Um, and Daniel, I've been tweeting or, or Xing him for months now, telling him to do this. I don't think he's seen my messages. I, I, I don't think I, I made this decision for him. But essentially what I was saying to, to Dan was, um, I used Spotify more than almost any human on the planet, right? It's 24-7 it's on our Alexas at home. It's, it's, it's always with me. When you get that Spotify wrapped thing, I think I was in like the top 0.001% of, of power users of, of the platform. I, I love it. And then I heard Kanye West singing Hey There Delilah. <laughs> on YouTube and I was like wow this AI music is getting great and it probably at a point took 50% of my Spotify usage I was spending hours and got the full <laughs> YouTube family premium and all of that stuff and um, just because you on YouTube you can type in any musician any song AI and you'll probably find a recording of that and most of them are pretty good like mm. you, you can barely tell the difference with, with, with a lot of them okay so 
I've been saying to Daniel for a long time, look, this is this, this could be really, really bad for you guys if you don't have AI music. If I'm, if I'm you know, leaving, I'm sure Spotify will be fine, but this is something that you need to, need to think about. Um, once again, I don't think he necessarily read what I, what I sent him, but they have made the, the decision which I, which I thought they should make, which was to keep AI music on the platform. I'm not sure if it's gonna be like a separate like section where you can like clearly see. Um, but yeah, what, what are your thoughts on, on this? Um, let's start with yourself, Sam. I think he's been very careful to draw a line between inspired by and copying. Sure, okay. Um, and the copyright challenges that exist there are gonna be interesting to yeah. watch unfold. Yeah. Um, uh, training a model to exactly replicate Kanye feels feels not very good for, uh, Kanye. for Kanye. Yeah, for, for everybody else, it's, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Whereas training a model to generate music that you enjoy, that sounds a bit like and is inspired by, feels a lot better. What do you think, though, if if it's trained on some Kanye West? music but then yeah then sort of doesn't recreate a Kanye West song creates another and maybe a ex other artist and sort of create something in between well that's where I mean the the next ones on on uh, Game of Thrones are going to hit the same problem of if you train a model is it still the same thing that it started out with mm. and it's a uh, uh, You're talking about like actors' faces. Actors' okay. faces. Yeah, You've got Bruce actors' faces. Bruce Willis has sold the rights to his face because uh -huh. he has a he has some kind of neurological disorder and he won't be able to do movies anymore. So they're going to be able to use his face in, in movies. But he's obviously signed those rights away. Yeah. Whereas this, I, I don't know the specifics, but I, I imagine people will just be able to upload an AI song that they cr created, perhaps um, unless the musician's given rights. I know some musicians have, like Grimes, for example. She's um, she's like releasing AI music and like partnering with mm -hmm. people and giving them parts of the of the money if they release it and giving them permission but um yeah i mean it's an interesting question because if kanye's voice is being sampled and mixed into and to create music just using him as a, as a hypothetical should he get money for that is that stealing is that copyright well you know this space well what's what, what's your yeah my, my opinion having you know worked with some of these models now really quite closely it's like if the thing has been trained on, you know, some sort of data source, it it, it can't. There, like, you actually have to put controls in place for it mm -hmm. not to just directly be able to recreate it. Yeah. Um. I mean, you you ask uh, if you ask a large language model whether they've been traced on some open source Kaggle data sets, it will tell you no. Yeah. But then you ask what are the what are the, the headers of the U.S. Census data, and it will literally spit them out verbatim, right? Yeah. yeah. Um. So it's it's. In my opinion, it's actually it's, it's pretty clear if if Kanye West's music is being used in the training of one of these um, generative models, Kanye West should get uh, yeah. a cut of, of the royalties for that, whether or not it's being used to create a Kanye West-like AI song or yeah. a song that is inspired by his music. Yeah. That that to me is just so clear, and I know. People, people can come back at that and have this conversation a lot and say, well, look, actually, what's Google kind of doing? And particularly if you look at the, you know, the sort of more text space rather than music, sure. Google is obviously sort of presenting back information mm -hmm. to you and kind of monetizing it through, through advertising. But there's just something here about totally leveraging a creator's piece of work. And it's, it's not then funneling it to, you know, funneling traffic to a creator like it, was, it would be in Google if it was a, someone finding a New York Times article and going to the New York Times, yeah. it's, it's leveraging, it's just totally cutting off the source yeah. of, of that sort of training information. So for me, it's, it's really clear. It should be I mean, if, if creators, musicians are going to be paid for parts of their voice being, being made, surely that extends to all areas, right? A journalist writing an article and then, you know, bars reciting that information. 100%. Mid-journey. Mm -hmm. A photographer in the Netherlands does that yeah. then you, you get a cut I mean how, how does that work and does it determine what percentage of the picture was used and that and then you got a fund and it goes to them it's probably the right way I think there's ways of doing it yeah I, I think this is we've seen this happen in the music industry we were talking about Spotify right yeah. right now it's it is the sort of the Napster moment we're in at the moment yeah. and Parker. perhaps a bit of the sort of bit torrent sort of mode where there are these systems for sort of kind of freely sharing this information when actually the you know the creators over a course of years will actually probably band together, the structures will be put in place, and actually there will be, and we're already seeing it, right? There's um, some of these large language model companies have 
already signed agreements with Reddit or yes. already signed agreements with Shutterstock. Yeah. So there's, uh, and that's going to happen. I think it's, it's, you know, they, they know it's coming. We know it's coming. It's great that there's been a sort of explosion. And, but I think by the time that this technology is really generating a lot of value, there will be these types of agreements in place for, for these creators. And there's another fundamental point here as well. That I think it touches on everything we've talked about today is yeah. that actually, the thing about these generative models is they are, you know, they're, they're using historical information. And, and yes, some of them are getting better at kind of seemingly create novel information. But the, the truth is they are, they mm -hmm. are trained on, um, on existing information out there. So there is, I think there's always going to be a role for creators here to, to create net new. Um, actually more, potentially more so. And, and maybe that, maybe that will increasingly get encroached on as well. And it's sort of the creativity element, but, uh, in my in my opinion, that's um, that's the direction of travel for the sector. Cool. Any final thoughts, Sam, on, on this piece? Yeah, I think I think we've got already models for royalties. We've got models in copyright for fair use. Yeah. Um, yeah, the creativity is the important thing. Um, current models churn, generate something that feels new, but really is is not really going to push the boundaries. Yeah, I think there is existing sort of copyright law, isn't there? I, I do wonder whether it's robust enough to sort of not yet <laughs> understand the yeah so i, I, I kind of I, I i get the point that i think some uk politicians are taking where actually like we do have pretty good regulation for this type of stuff already let's use that but uh, you know i that needs to be tested i think yeah. and um but it should land that the you know creators get uh, the opportunity to leverage the tech uniquely for spotify they're in sweden so, and I know the laws over there are very, very different to the copyright laws mm. here and stuff. So it'd be interesting to see if that plays a factor. Hey, really quick video just to give you a free subscription to Coda magazine. Coda is the number one publication for all the latest tech news, expert insights, and exclusive industry interviews. With Coda, you get the inside scoop on what's happening with Elon Musk, with Bill Gates, with Jeff Bezos, with Mark Zuckerberg, and so much more. So if you work in the technology industry, then I'd highly recommend that you give Coda a read today. Just scan the QR code on the screen for free access now or go to welovealpha.com forward slash magazine to get your free subscription today. Um, you mentioned Game of Thrones and that, that, that ties us nicely into the final story because the Game of Thrones author has sued OpenAI over copyright claims. So George R. R. Martin claims that Sam Altman's chat GPT has used his books without permission, which is basically an extension of what we were talking about. But mm. if we if we specifically um, look at it from the angle of an author, you know, I've, I've written a book. If if if, uh, if Bard or OpenAI took that information and started giving it to people, I'd certainly feel a little bit like, hang on a second, like. But I, I get the angle that they're coming from as well. But what, what, what are your takes? What, what do you think? Yeah, from for me, it feels like the the, the, the same same point. Actually, to be honest, it's it, it is a creator. There's there is some nuance between sort of music and and the written word. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities as, as well. But again, as George 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 R. R. Martin has got perfectly reasonable. Yeah. grounds to, to mm -hmm. kick up a fuss, I, I think. And, and I, I, as I say, I think the direction of travel is that these large language model companies are going to have to start coughing up for that, basically. Yeah. I wonder whether it's accurate, of course. I mean, I could go onto the internet and find out everything about Game of Thrones without actually reading the Game of Thrones books. Yeah. There's I, enough I, content I mean, out there in the world to have achieved what it is yes. that GPT can do. I notice that nowhere is open and I kind of say, no, it definitely wasn't us training this. But yeah. They've not come out and said this is this is catastrophically not, not true. They, yeah. They've kind of just said, uh, let's keep it for the courts. So Yeah. They scraped the entire internet and have sold it back to us for £20 a month, basically. <laughs> which yeah. um, which is fine. It's like a fancier, better Google. Because when, mm. when you go to Google, you, you don't... When you type a question in or search of something, you don't want a bunch of ads and then and then you've got to scroll down and then you, you click on it and you research. You just want the answer. Yep. So um, I get this is a bit of a different question, really, but do, do you think something like a GPT tool could replace Google if, if, if it's giving you what you need rather than a list of links yeah, and ads? Definitely. Yeah, I already am. That's my, my main use for it, I think, to yeah. be honest. It's like search, sort of yeah. collating and uh, quickly aggregating and communicating in a much better way what would take you much longer to do on, on, on Google, which I think is a nice sort of 
more positive ending ending note right there is yes. there is uh there is real value in that and i also i like the model that it uh produces which means people like you and i are happy to spend 20 bucks a month on on that yeah, yeah. rather than being targeted with lots of micro advertising kind of which is the model that google has to follow because no one's going to pay for search yeah. so mm -hmm. I, I you know that could all change again like you know i'm sure there will be adverts in the in the winners of this uh whoever wins the sort of the, the sort of large language model search functionality I'm, I'm sure that will happen eventually but for now it's it's a lovely model and it, I think it's much but much healthier for society um, and I think as well just the last maybe my last point is yeah the speaking to some of my music um, artist friends that some of them are quite excited about it yeah. um, as, as a tool and um, it's much like I don't know people make comparisons with with Photoshop, for example, in, in like the image space, and, yes. and like you can see that with developers using mm -hmm. Copilot right now, and, and even I, that enables me to write you know code that works, um, <laughs> which is uh, quite a surprise sometimes. But um, for for the for the music space and the, and the writing space, I, I, there is there's definitely value there. I think mm -hmm. they've just got to figure out that that little detail around copyrights and, and how it, and how that works. But yeah. it will be a tool eventually. Yeah, I agree with you. What, what do you think, Sam? I strongly agree that it, AI and the tools that you produce with it, rather than treating it as an end state in itself. Sure. Um, Photoshop is a tool that photographers went, oh, this is going to ruin our world. You can fake things. Mm. Other photographers went, this is a really cool tool. I can make yeah, yeah. new things using this tool. Mm. Um, that's where we'll see the biggest winners. I was just showing you before the pod, AI pictures of myself, right? I mean, we, we didn't need a photographer. We didn't need a graphic designer. We just uploaded a bunch of images and boom, we had a month's worth of social media content. Soon we won't need podcast hosts. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a little bit more nervous about that sort of thing, right? I mean, there is, there is literally hundreds of hours of my voice and face on the internet. So anybody could make me say anything if they really wanted to. Do not do that, please. I don't wanna, I'm not selling your product, whatever it is. <laughs> cool. All right, I think, I think that's a wrap. Thank you very much for your time. All right, well, thank you very much. Cool. Hey, thanks for watching this podcast. Make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, comment, etc., etc. And I'll see you in the next episode.